Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 29. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Lord God, we come before you this morning as those who are grateful for your word, uh, grateful for all that you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray that you would open our eyes, that you would open our hearts here this morning to see wonderful things in your word and to receive it with faith and with joy. And so, uh, Father, would you be at work here among us today? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, we please be seated. Uh, and as you sit, uh, keep your bulletins. They are open to Hebrews chapter 12, or uh, better yet, if you have a Bible with you this morning, um, Hebrews chapter 12 is where we are. There's some Bibles in the pews. You're welcome to use uh, those, you can even take one home with you. If you don't have a Bible at home, you're welcome to uh, take that and, and use it. Uh, one day, Jesus was uh, traveling between the region of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered one of the villages that was along that route. And, and when he did so, he was met by ten lepers. Now, these lepers, they didn't come uh, immediately up to Jesus. They, they kept their distance like lepers were supposed to do because leprosy was conceived of as being a, a highly contagious disease. And so those who had it, they were uh, kept separated from the rest of the community. Uh, under the Old Testament law, a leper was required to uh, wear torn clothes and to uh, let the hair of his head hang loose. And he was supposed to uh, cover his upper lip. And as he walked through the community, he was supposed to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that people could, could safely keep their distance from the lepers. And so all of that meant that for a leper, their life was one that was really, it, it was desperate. It was miserable. It was, a, it was an isolated life. And so these ten lepers, while keeping their distance, they, they shout out to Jesus from that distance and they say to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy upon us. And if you know the story, you know that Jesus in response does just that. And he gives them the instruction to, to go and as they go, this miraculous event happens to them. They are cleansed of their debilitating, ostracizing disease. It's Luke who recounts this incident for us in Luke chapter 17. And when he does, he, he notes this, quote, One of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving Jesus thanks. Now, the healing grace that this man had received from Jesus resulted in a 
uh, response of gratitude from this man that he just couldn't keep from expressing. Uh, he's so filled with gratitude, he, he's singing God's praises, and he, he falls at the very feet of Jesus, giving Jesus thanks. But then Jesus asks a series of rhetorical questions. Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this man? And as Jesus asks those questions, it's really a powerful indictment against thanklessness. Ten men are healed, but only one gives thanks. Uh, Friends, I open with that story here this morning uh, because my prayer for us today is that each of us will leave here today like that one healed leper, praising and thanking God for all that he has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's what this passage from Hebrews chapter 12 is in fact designed to do in our lives. It's designed to draw out from us a response of enduring gratitude. So we are uh, continuing our study of Hebrews uh, here this morning, and what we're looking at here today is a continuation from what we finished last week. And if you you look at the very first word there of verse 18, you can see the connection going backwards. Uh, Verse 18 begins with the word for, okay, which means that it's building on a point that was made in the previous verses. And the point that was made immediately before this was a warning to not be like Esau. So if you have a a Bible open in front of you, look at verse 16, where we were instructed in verse 16 to make sure that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears." So so Esau, he he was the firstborn son. He had the the birthright of a firstborn son. And all of the the amazing blessings and and promises that went with that in that day. And yet what we learn here, and what we learn as you read in Genesis, is he gave gave all of that up for a single meal. Uh, He traded the joy and the blessing of a a firstborn son for the, the fleeting physical satisfaction and comfort of this world. And so that's the point being made immediately before our passage today, and which our passage then is building on. And our passage is building on it in such a way that what verses 18 to 29 are doing is giving us further reasons for why we shouldn't be like Esau. Why shouldn't we be like Esau? Verse 18, for you have not come to what may be touched, etc., And in fact, verses 18 to 29 here are really the the culmination of the argument of this entire letter. I actually think you could say that this whole letter has been written in order to help this this Hebrew uh, church filled with these Hebrew Christians to to not become a church that's filled with lots of Esau's. In other words, this whole letter is written to keep them from from letting go of those tremendous blessings that they have in Jesus and exchanging those blessings for for mere temporary physical comforts that will not last. Because that's the temptation they're facing. Life in this world is becoming difficult for them as followers of Jesus, and so the temptation is to go back to their old Jewish way of life so they can then, they think, have more satisfaction and more ease and more comfort in this world. And so this whole letter is essentially saying, don't do it. Don't you remember? That's what Esau did. He gave it all up. Don't be like Esau. And thus, so much of the teaching of this letter is summarized here now in verses 18 to 29. And so, friends, here's what I recommend you doing today. Uh, After our study here today, I recommend you go home and you read through all of Hebrews again so that you can see even more clearly just how all of the teaching and the theology of the first 11 and a half chapters is, is packed tightly into the second half here of chapter 12. Because the number of, of connections and themes is extraordinarily rich and edifying. And so all that means that there's lots we can say here this morning. We're going to try to keep things simple, though. So here's what we're going to emphasize today, just very simply. The main point of these verses is to say, don't be like Esau, and here's why. 
And the way the author makes that point is by once again showing us the vast superiority of the new covenant to the old covenant. And the primary way he shows us that is by contrasting two mountains and two kingdoms. Okay, so we're going to look at those two contrasts and then we'll, we'll finish up by considering the response of gratitude and worship that all of this demands of us. Right, unlike Esau, who wasn't grateful for his birthright, uh, we want to be those who express the right kind of gratitude to God for the blessings that we have in Jesus. So to help us uh, get to that place of gratitude, uh, the first and par- primary contrast we see here is that between two mountains. Uh, verses 18 to 21 Uh, describe Mount Sinai and and all that that mountain symbolizes. And then in contrast, verses 22 to 24, describe Mount Zion and all that that mountain symbolizes. Now, uh, Mount Sinai isn't actually mentioned by name here, but that's what's being described in verses 18 to 21. Look at verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, And the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So if you were to go and you were to read uh, Exodus chapter 19 in the Old Testament, those are the things that you would read about which took place at Mount Sinai. Uh, Shortly after uh, the Israelites left Egypt, they came to Mount Sinai. And remember Moses, he'd gone up on the mountain to meet with God where he would receive the Ten Commandments. Uh, But with that came everything that's described here in Hebrews 12. Uh, There was fire and and darkness and and gloom surrounding the whole thing. And, And there were strict limits on how close the people could get to the mountain. Hence the instruction that even if an animal touches the mountain, that animal needs to be killed. And the people, they they were terrified by the whole scene, and and rightly so. Because because what was being revealed in all of that is the absolute holiness of God. That's what the law that Moses had received from God revealed. It revealed the holy character of God. And so in setting those limits about how close they could draw near, God was actually protecting the people because in their sin, the holiness of God would consume them. God was a a consuming fire to them on Mount Sinai. And so again, what that whole scene at Mount Sinai was communicating was the holiness of God. And the way that our sin keeps us separate from the presence of God. And it was all so fearsome that we're told that even Moses was afraid. Because that's what happens when sinful people encounter a holy God without a mediator. Terror overwhelms them. But what the author of Hebrews is saying here is, brothers and sisters, that's that's no longer the mountain you've come to. Uh, Mount Sinai represents the old covenant. It represents the the giving of the law and the the judgment of God against sin without without a mediator there to help you. And thus it's characterized by by darkness and dread and death. And he's saying to them, you've not come to that mountain anymore. In Jesus Christ, you've not come to that mountain. You've come to a different mountain. Because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, who's your mediator and your savior, you now have come to Mount Zion. And that is a radically different experience. Uh, Whereas Mount Sinai is very physical and earthly, Mount Zion is spiritual and heavenly. And whereas Mount Sinai is filled with darkness and fear and restrictions about how close you can get, Mount Zion is the exact opposite. It's characterized by joy and celebration and and community and and closeness to God. At Mount Zion, you can actually draw near to God. And because of the blood of Jesus covering you, not be destroyed by his holiness. Look at the description given there in verse 22 and the sharp contrast being drawn. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. 
and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So again, when Hebrews uses here the language of Mount Zion, it's it's not a reference to an earthly mountain. Uh, the, The clear reference here is to a heavenly mountain. But the reason the name Mount Zion is used is because Zion and and Jerusalem are essentially interchangeable terms in the Bible. Uh, Mount Zion had eventually become so identified with Jerusalem that it became uh, basically synonymous with the city. And so when the Bible then uh, looks ahead to the the new creation that's to come, as is described in the book of Revelation, right, the the heavenly city of God is called the New Jerusalem. It's called the, the heavenly Jerusalem, and thus the term here, Mount Zion. And so in one sense, what's being described is a a future reality for us because we're not actually in heaven yet. But on the other hand, it's a reality that's also very much true for us right now because of the cross of Jesus, which is why the author speaks about this in the present tense. You have come to Mount Zion. In other words, Christian, this is true of you now. Uh, This is your reality even now before you get to heaven and experience it in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can right now draw near to God who is the judge of all. That was the message to this church. And friends, that same message is being declared to us here this morning as well. That in Jesus we have the most extraordinary blessings given to us. When we put our faith in Jesus, it means that we don't need to go to any earthly mountain or human shrine to meet God. Rather, we have come to a heavenly spiritual city that's accessible to us anywhere in this world. It's the assembly of heaven itself. We're gathered our innumerable angels in festal gathering. You can't even count the number of angels that surround the throne of God as they sing his praises and bask in his glory. And it's not just angels who are gathered there. It's all the people of God, including that whole cloud of witnesses that we we studied back in chapter 11, described here as being the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. In other words, for those who put their faith in Jesus and are relying on him as their high priest and mediator before God, their names, your names, brothers and sisters, are written in heaven. You are enrolled in heaven. And even right now, as you trudge through this city, you slog through your days, you are enrolled in heaven. And what's even more amazing is that you're not enrolled as a second-class citizen, but rather you're enrolled as one who's firstborn. What a privilege that is. No, that's not because of you. You didn't earn that title, that identity. You don't get that special enrollment as the firstborn because of some merit you achieved. You get that designation because of Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn par excellence. And you are united to Jesus by faith. And so, brothers and sisters, what that means, you see, is that every Christian believer who's ever lived, including you and me here today, together, we right now, form this assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. I mean, this is a glorious thought. We're part of this heavenly assembly. By the way, um, let me just do a little bit of a sidebar here. Probably another, I've been here for 12 years, probably another 12 years before I preach on Hebrews 12 again, so just a little bit of a sidebar. Uh, This word translated here as assembly, you see that there? Uh, Verse 23 that word is the word ecclesia. Okay, the word that we usually use to translate the word church. So when you're reading through your New Testament, you come across the word church. Behind that is the Greek word ecclesia. That's the word that's being used here, translated as assembly. In fact, uh, maybe in your Bible there, they translate it like that, or they give you a footnote that, that what's, you could you could you say the, the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Now that's significant. Here's why. It's significant because this is what the Bible means by the idea that sometimes is referred to as the universal church. Um, Contrary to the way that Christians maybe sometimes speak, the Bible doesn't really speak of there being a universal church on earth. 
I, th- I think sometimes we, we maybe wrongly think that a u- the universal church is made up of all of the churches all over the earth, right? And that's the universal church. You put them all together, you get the universal church. But actually, biblically, this here in Hebrews 12 is the universal church. It's the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, which again is formed by every believer who's ever lived, including us here today. And friends, what that means then for us is we gather like this as a, as a local church here on earth. It means that as we gather, what's going on here is that as we assemble together, as we, as we have this ecclesia together, we then become a, a small manifestation of that heavenly assembly. And so again, you don't get the universal church by adding up all the churches and Christians here on earth. Rather, the universal church is that heavenly assembly, and we here on earth we are an expression of that heavenly assembly. If you were to sort of think of a, a diagram and how you might diagram this, you know, maybe the, the wrong way to think about it, again, is you, you add up all the churches here on earth, and then at the end, you get the, the one big universal church. But actually, the Bible's saying kind of the, the inverse. You begin with the universal church, the heavenly assembly, and then from there, you have every local church on earth is a manifestation of that one universal heavenly assembly. And that's what we are here today. Now, I know as you look around the room, this doesn't look like heaven. At least I, I hope not, right? I mean, I hope, I hope, I hope there's no red curtains in heaven uh, behind me here. So I know it doesn't look like heaven, and it's not. But in another sense, that's exactly what this is right here. Right? That heavenly assembly is the main gathering, the universal gathering. And we are a small expression of that here on earth. And so there's many implications for that. I mean, one of the implications is that when we gather together, we want our gatherings to, as much as possible, uh, express that heavenly gathering. And so we want our gatherings to be characterized by celebration. Uh, We want our gatherings to be focused on Jesus. Uh, We want our gatherings to be filled with thanksgiving. Uh, We want to emphasize in our gatherings uh, drawing near to God. We want to emphasize in our gathering the fellowship that we we share as as firstborn children of God in Jesus Christ, uh, realizing that we're part of something far beyond ourselves even when we meet here like this. And so, friends, I hope all that gives you a, a greater appreciation for what's happening when we gather as a local church here on earth and the significance of what it means for us to assemble ourselves together and why it's so important that we don't neglect to meet together. Again, I know as you look around, we may not seem all that significant. We're small in number. We're struggling along in many ways. But nonetheless, we are an earthly outpost of that heavenly Mount Zion. And friends, that's true of every local church. That's why we embrace the opportunities to partner with other churches. It's because every genuine Bible-believing, Christ-trusting local church is an expression of of that universal heavenly church. And so as we come to Mount Zion, uh, we gather with the angels, we gather with the other firstborn children, and we do so as we come here together into the very presence of God, who notice is described here as being the judge of all. Isn't it interesting that that's how the Bible would choose to speak of God in this instance? We have come into the presence of the one who is our judge. And yet the point is, though we've done so, we have nothing to fear. Yes, God is the judge, but we need not cower in fear before the judge anymore. In fact, those in his presence are described as the spirits of the righteous made perfect. In other words, in in the presence of the judge are those who need not fear his judgment because the guilt of their sin has been taken away and therefore they're now seen as perfect in the eyes of the judge. And of course the reason why is because there, right beside the judge, is Jesus himself. Described here as the mediator of a new covenant. And so we can draw near to God who is the judge of all. And we can do so with joy and confidence because we've been sprinkled 
with the blood of Jesus. And as verse 24 tells us, the sprinkled blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. When Abel was murdered by his brother Cain, his blood cried out for justice and and for vengeance. But you see, the the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. Uh, On the cross, Jesus received God's judgment for our sins. And so the blood of Jesus now speaks not not a word of of judgment against us. Rather, it speaks the word of forgiveness and mercy and grace. Again, contrast that with Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, the speaking of God was such that they they said, no more. They said, God, stop speaking. We, We don't want to hear it. No more. We can't take it. But in the Christian experience, the voice we hear is the voice of the the sprinkled blood of our mediator. And friends, that blood says, I love you, I forgive you, I purchase you, I cleanse you, I protect you, I keep you, I will always be there for you. these These are two very different mountains, aren't they? So let me ask you, which mountain describes your experience with God? Which mountain describes your experience with God? Is your relationship with God characterized by fear and dread and distance from Him? Are you afraid to hear what He has to say to you? Are you running and hiding from Him? Or is your relationship with God characterized by the celebration and the community and the confidence and the closeness of those who come to Mount Zion. You know, friends, your answer will reveal to you how well you really understand the gospel. It will reveal to you whether you've truly heard and believed that better word that the sprinkled blood of Jesus, the mediator, speaks to you. And Christian friends, again, the point here is to Challenge us to not forsake these extraordinary blessings that we have in Jesus. Again, don't be like Esau. Remember, Esau was identified as the firstborn. That was Esau's birthright. But he gave it up. For a pot of soup, he gave it up. Would you really give up all of the heavenly spiritual blessings of Mount Zion for some some fleeting earthly comfort and for a life where you try to live in the presence of God without a mediator? Brothers and sisters, to do so would be as foolish and short-sighted as exchanging your birthright for a single meal. So that's the first contrast. Don't be like Esau, because you have not come to Mount Sinai Rather, you have come to Mount Zion with all of its blessings and privileges. And then secondly, beginning at verse 25, we're also shown here a contrast between two kingdoms. Uh, The kingdom of the earth, which will be shaken and destroyed at the final judgment, and the kingdom of heaven, which cannot be shaken and will therefore endure forever. And thus... We should not be like Esau in rejecting the promises of God and in choosing the fleeting things of this earth. Uh, As we've seen so many times in this letter, not only are we uh, being encouraged and exhorted to endure uh, by by giving us uh, blessings and and descriptions of glory and thus motivating us in that way, but, but we're also exhorted and encouraged through warnings and and a description of the consequences of what happens if we don't endure. And and so it is here. We come to another warning in this letter. Verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. The blood of Jesus speaks grace and love to us. It's a wonderful word. It's a gracious gift. But it has to be accepted. We must not refuse it. Verse 25 continues. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. 
Okay, so those at Mount Sinai who failed to heed God's warnings, they, they came under judgment. And the same is true now if we reject this warning that Jesus is giving us from heaven, which is the warning that apart from his mediating work, we will face the judgment of God. And so at verses 26 and 27 are then describing our God's future judgment upon this world. You see that there? Verses 26 and 27, in the same way that God shook Mount Sinai in judgment, uh, so too he has promised that one day he will shake the whole world, meaning that the, the whole world will come under his judgment. And so in verse 26 there, that's a quote from Haggai chapter 2. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And then as Hebrews tells us, verse 27, this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Okay, so a future judgment is coming in which God will judge everything. Not one stone, heaven or on earth, will be unturned. It will all come under God's judgment. And everything we're being told here that is not of him, every sin, every idol, every, every man-made religion, and every kingdom of this earth, it will all be destroyed. And all that will be left is the kingdom of God. And Esau chose the kingdom of the earth that will one day be shaken. And we are being exhorted to not do that, but to keep choosing the kingdom of God which cannot be shaken which is the very kingdom of Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the assembly of the firstborn who have Jesus as their mediator. Brothers and sisters, God's kingdom will prevail. But nothing can stop it from prevailing over every kingdom and ruler of this world. And therefore, if you make the choice to reject it, there will be no escape. You will come under the judgment of God and it will be more terrible than anything experienced at Mount Sinai. Because if you reject it, you will be eternally shaken. And friends, I think one of the implications of this passage for us who are Christians is that we should be really truthful in our evangelism. And that means speaking of both the joys and the warnings that come with the gospel message. Uh, the word that the sprinkled blood of Jesus speaks is a word of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And because of that blood, there are magnificent blessings and joys to be experienced for eternity, including the joy of being part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I mean, just think of how, how, how fragile our lives seem in this world. And yet, because of the blood of Jesus, we can be part of a kingdom that will never be shaken where there's eternal security and peace and rest. I mean, we should tell people about these things. Uh, we, 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 should, we should tell them with joy, that there's joy to be had here. We should reflect the joy of the gospel in our lives. But at the same time, we must not present the gospel to people as an offer that they can simply take or leave. Friends, listen, the word of the gospel comes with an ultimatum. Yes, it's a joyful invitation, but let's be clear, it's, it's also an ultimatum. If you refuse it, there will be no escape. That's how the Bible describes it here. You, you won't escape. Escape what? Escape the judgment of God. Jesus is your only escape. And so I know it can be uncomfortable to express this. I find it hard. I wish I was a better model for you in this. But we have to be honest about things like the judgment of God in hell and the terrors of facing the one who is the judge of all without a mediator. So we have a contrast between two mountains. We have a contrast between two kingdoms. And the goal of which is to help us see why we should not be like Esau who turned his back on all that was good for the fleeting pleasures of that which will not last. And so all of that here now brings us to the proper way in which we should respond. Now look at verse 28. 
Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Friends, why why do you think it is that people walk away from faith in Christ? Now, I realize that even as I ask that question, there are no doubt many answers to it. Many people wrestling with very difficult things and trying to sort through, trying to understand, wrestling with God. But, But still, I mean, even given that, I mean, there's so many blessings. The joys of Mount Zion are so spectacular. The promise of this heavenly city to come, which which we get to experience even now. Uh, The kindness of God in giving us a mediator who covers our sins by his blood. The assurance of an unshakable kingdom. I mean, why would anybody see and believe these things at one moment in their life and then come to the point where they say, no more, I don't want it, I'm willing to let it all go. I mean, how does that happen? Well, again, no doubt there are many reasons, I suppose. But perhaps one of the most significant factors that leads to this kind of willingness to let go of such blessings begins with a failure to give thanks. There is, in fact, good biblical support for such an idea. Now, Romans one twenty one indicates that actually at the root of all sin and rebellion against God is a lack of gratitude to God. I mean, imagine if Esau had woke up every morning and began his day by going into his father Isaac's presence in order to give thanks to his father for his birthright. Father, I'm so grateful to be part of your family. I'm so grateful for this this privilege that I have. I don't deserve it. I'm so grateful that you're my father. I love you and I want to honor you in all that I do. I suspect, had Esau made a regular habit of doing that, he would not then have been so quick to exchange that birthright for a single meal. And so the response that the author of Hebrews is calling us to is a response of gratefulness. You belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So be grateful. Christian friends, cultivating gratitude in your hearts will keep you from wandering away from God. And not only that, but as you cultivate this gratitude, it will naturally lead to the second way we're called to respond here, and that's to offer to God acceptable worship. In other words, worship God as those who are grateful. Worship God as those who are humble. Worship God as those who are dependent on the blood of Jesus for such worship. Worship God as those who understand and acknowledge just how much they've been forgiven. Like like that one lone leper who returned to Jesus. He, being healed of his leprosy, changed his life. Because we understand how much we've been forgiven. We fall on our knees and praise God and thank Jesus for all that he's done for us. That's acceptable worship. And it's to be done with reverence and awe. Because look at the closing note of this passage. Verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Friends, does it surprise you that our passage ends on that note? The note that our God in his holiness and majesty is a consuming fire? Well, here's what we must understand. We must understand the God of Mount Zion is not different than the God of Mount Sinai. He is still the God who is the consuming fire, who in his holiness consumes all that is sinful. The only difference is that we now have a mediator by which we can draw near to this God who is a consuming fire. 
We now have the blood of Jesus that covers all of our sin so that we're not consumed by the fire of his holiness. And you see, when when you don't let yourself forget that, when you don't try to trivialize God and ignore his holiness, the recognition of his holiness then only serves to accentuate the glory and beauty of his grace all the more. And the more these realities sink into you, the more consistently grateful you become. So let me encourage you to to develop the daily habit of thanking the Lord for the salvation he's given you. Actually verbalize it. Literally tell him that you're grateful. Speak the words. Tell him how grateful you are that he's enrolled you in heaven as part of the assembly of the firstborn. Thank him for the the privilege of being able to draw near to him, not with fear and dread, but with confidence and joy. In other words, thank him for all the blessings associated with Mount Zion. Thank him for allowing you to be part of this kingdom that cannot be shaken. Thank him for the blood of Jesus, your mediator. Let me invite you to take a few moments on your own to do that just now.